Good morning, everybody. That was a blessing. Open, if you would, in your Bibles to the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at verse 26. On Wednesday nights, we're also in the Gospel of Luke, and you'll enjoy that study. This is just a taste of something. Uh, we'll be uh, actually dealing with this verse, I guess, in a couple of weeks in there, but in a different context. Luke chapter 5, verse 26. Would you stand in honor of God's Word? Luke 5, 26. And of course I'm reading from the King James Bible. I almost always do. <laughs> they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, We have seen strange things today. Father, I pray this morning you'd guide these feeble lips and all our hearts and minds. We need your word. It's our privilege to come to your word. And I ask you, Father, to bless in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Why, why would the miraculous be seen as strange? Well, I'll answer that question for you in probably the same way most of you might as well. It is because miracles are unusual. For 400 years before Jesus came and before John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, there had not only not been a writing prophet, there had not only been not only not been any legitimate scripture for 400 years before the time of Christ, after the time of Malachi, there had not really been any attesting miracles either. Now when we say attesting miracles, we know that there are probably people that ask and ask God to save their loved one from death and God granted it. That may well have happened. But as far as really bona fide, obvious out of the ordinary things that were different from the world the world normally works, acts floating miracles. Man, there hadn't been any for 400 years. And then Jesus comes, and as the Son of God, He begins to do miracle after miracle after miracle. When we take this particular passage, uh, we have a man who's been healed of his palsy, of his basic paralysis, and people are wowed by this. I want to talk to you this morning about the response to the miracles of Jesus Christ. You know, people wish for miracles. They pray for miracles, but indeed when miracles happen, like first century folk, we think that's strange. And in fact, we are almost in the, in the, in the category of people who think, yes, maybe God would heal a sick person and we, we wouldn't be able to prove it, but we would, we would know and, and someone else might question that God healed the sick person or God might do a financial miracle for someone, but you could always explain it away. But we're in the category of people that if we really did see an ax flow or if we saw somebody arise that was clearly paralyzed and then it was a clear, bona fide, no other way to explain it, miracle, we like they might say, that's strange. And the first response that they had was amazement. Had we not ought to be amazed at what God can do? Had we not ought to be amazed at the power of God? The Bible says here in the original language, they were ecstatically moved. They became ecstatic. They became extremely excited. They became almost high with the power of God. Folks, here's the thing. What the devil parrots, what the devil gives a false account of, what the devil gives a false uh, type of, God gives ecstasy. God gives that power within ourselves that realizes He is at work and He is working in the lives of His people and that Jesus has come to change the world. No doubt, folks lost their breath. Hearts beat fast. There was amazement at the power of God. I submit to you that in 2017 we still need amazement at the power of God. We need a situation where people are not just saying, well, hey, uh, this is the Bible. I need to believe the Bible. I need to get back right with the Lord and get strong in the Lord. And I need to be listening to some of the things that God has to say. All those things are, of course, true. But we need to get back to a place where we are in awestruck amazement at the power of God. That leads to revival, doesn't it? 
Two weeks ago, we had our revival. It was a wonderful time. Many came and prayed at the altar. I was glad to see that, obviously. But what we need above all in America today, in our church and among evangelical Christians, is again a fresh move of God where we are wowed in amazement at the power of what God can do. Not just that we doctrinally, biblically, 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 biblically believe the right things, but that we see that God is doing something powerful, something amazing, and we are moved to ecstasy. But dizzying miracles don't always have the effect on people that they ought to have. In John chapter 2, we see a very interesting account. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the second chapter of the book of John. The next gospel in your Bible. John chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 23 through 25 there. John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem in the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There were, there were people in Jesus' day who saw him do great miracles. And the Bible says in Luke, they were amazed. In John chapter 2, it talks about the fact that they were so moved by His miracles that they believed, but the way that they believed was clearly not a way that was going to change their heart and life like it ought to. No, what we need today is amazement in the presence of God that makes a real fundamental change in the people of God and makes a real fundamental change in our world so that we can sing with reality that him, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Let me ask you, are we amazed at the power of God? Didn't ask you, do you believe in the power of God? Didn't ask you, do you believe that God's word is true? I hope all those are true. But do we stand in awestruck, slack-jawed amazement at the power of Almighty God? When God gets to doing miracles in the lives of His people amazement, life-changing amazement, we would hope, begins to happen. The Bible says here also, though, that the glorification of God happened. In this particular case, though it doesn't always happen, and Jesus said that He didn't trust Himself to people sometimes when they had a superficial response to miracles, but in this case, there was the glorification of God. They're filled with fear, and that they glorified God. Folks, the number one thing that needs to happen in all the world is the glorification of God. We think sometimes the number one thing that needs to happen is that some social ill would be wiped out, that there wouldn't be an abortion anymore, and that we would be traditional marriage again. All those things are great, and they're wonderful, and they're good, and that people would be saved. Amen. We are left here to share the gospel that people might be saved. All of the wonderful things that could happen. Our culture could return back to the Lord God. We could be an influence in the world. But at the heart of it has to be that God get glory. When somebody gets saved, it's going to influence this culture. If a lot, millions and millions of people in America got saved, it would influence this culture in powerful ways. We are a predicated culture on being a godly people. And when people get saved, that means that they are not going to go to hell anymore. Amen? If you care for your friends and neighbors and you share Jesus, they're not going to go to hell anymore. But the number one thing is that God be glorified. The reason everything exists is for the glory of God. The ultimate end of all things is the glory of God. If nothing else in the world happens and God gets glory, things are good. God ought to be glorified. You know the reason you and I shouldn't glorify ourselves or others? Because only God should be glorified. You shouldn't brag on yourself. Because only God should be glorified. You and I shouldn't think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Because only God should be glorified. But it is appropriate for Jesus to say who God is. It was appropriate for Jesus to say 
that uh, before Abraham was, I am. It was appropriate for Jesus to point to the glory of God and to manifest His own miracles to point to Himself as the divine Son of God. It is appropriate that God be glorified. The devil's great fall was in his pride. He sought to usurp somehow the position of God. And that's what pride always is. But God ought to be glorified. So that when people began to glorify God, everything else falls into place. What are we saying? We're saying this. The number one problem in our nation and world today isn't that little babies are being aborted. Okay, you okay? It's okay. Are you okay? All right. The number one problem in our world today is that the little babies are being uh, murdered. The number one problem in our, our world today is that gay marriage. The number one problem in our world isn't any other social ill that you could think of or war with North Korea. The number one problem that we have is that God isn't being lifted up. If He be lifted up, then all men will be drawn to Him. The number one important thing in all the world is Almighty God be glorified. The number one important thing about the response to miracles is that people began to look up and say how great Almighty God is, that He is holy other. The number one reason we are here this morning in worship, we're here to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to learn God's Word, but above all to say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, You are holy, You are other, You are worthy of our worship, adoration, and thanksgiving. When we begin to see God for who He is in His powerful glory, then we have reverential fear. When the Bible says that they glorified God and were filled with fear, I think that the appropriate fear that people have when they come into the presence of God is not the morbid fear of the lost. A lost person who refuses to come to Christ will stand before the wrath of God. In this world, they have no fear of God. They shake their arrogant, silly little fists in the face of God. But someday they will stand before the awesome justice of a holy God and they will have a morbid, sick fear in their gut when they face the great white throne of God. But the child of God also has a fear of God. It is a reverential fear of God that says, Oh my God, you are so awesome. That respects our God. That respects Him as the Holy One who so loved us that He sent His Son. But we do stand amazed in His presence. And we have a reverential fear of our God who we know loves us. We could make some analogy to an earthly parent. I, I believe, I want to think, I guess you guys could interview them, but I think that every one of my kids knew that I loved them. They, they never had uh, a morbid fear of their dad. I wasn't an abusive, mean daddy. I didn't beat him or hurt him or anything like that. I pray God none of you did that. I don't think you did. And it's a horrible thing if a child has to endure that. But I do hope that there were times that they realized daddy's on the job. You know, do you not know that God is a God who is holy, awesome, and powerful? The book of Hebrews says that He chastises those whom He loves and every and reproves every son whom He receives. We do serve a God who is awesome, powerful, and wonderful. In the midst of a world that says maybe there isn't even a God, maybe we're just all evolved. Pond scum. A day will come when every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And these people were struck with reverent fear of God. They glorified Him. And it is a reverent fear of God that changed their lives. Jesus here does such in such a way that causes people to be wowed with the presence and glory of God and to be filled with appropriate fear of God. John Calvin years ago in his Institutes of the Christian Religion said, and this of course translated in English, he said in particular the miserable ruin into which the revolt of the first man has plunged us compels us to turn our eyes upwards not only that while being hungry and famishing we may thence ask what we want 
but being aroused by fear may learn humility. Isn't that spot on? The, the, the problem with man who doesn't fear and reverence and glorify God is this. He begins to think of himself in a very proud way. He begins to think, well, I've done it all. I've accomplished everything for myself. I went out there and I grabbed hold of the brass ring and I brought it to myself. And he began more and more to think, do I really even need God? And especially in our opulent culture, in our materially blessed culture, it is easy for people to begin to forget who God is. To forget that there is a God in heaven. That they ought to fall before their faces in humble worship. And there is nothing greater than to fall before your face in humble worship of God. There is nothing that plugs in our soul like really worshiping God. Because what we're designed to do is worship Almighty God. God. That's what we ought to really want to do. And the more you worship God, the more you realize this is wonderfully, powerfully real. Awesome. And sometimes we stand before God, even in His grace, and we stand humble like Isaiah did in chapter 6 when he said, when he came in the presence of God, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King. The Lord of hosts. You see, that is what happens to people when they see the power of God happening. We learn a lot of humility about ourselves and then we become very usable for God. Jesus did miracles to the glory of God. Yes, this man got healed in our chapter in Luke and he got to walk and it was a wonderful thing and it was a blessing. But above all, it was done to glorify God, to show the power of God, to bring about reverence and change lies and not just to wow the masses or to be a dog and pony trick. No, indeed, what we need in our world today is humble worship and glorification of Almighty God, where people are moved, where they legitimately become repentant of sin. When we come before the altars of this church and churches all about America and cry out about our sin and realize how powerful God is, and when people realize how powerful God is, then the power of God can begin to be more and more operative in our lives, in our culture, in our world. And that is, my friend, all good. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray you guide us in the direction of your will. As we come now to a time of invitation, I pray, Father, that in my own mind, in all of our minds, we'd be struck with your power, your importance, that we'd be people of prayer and worship and thanksgiving, that we'd be people who see your power and stand amazed in your presence. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.